Um, okay. So we were continuing the laws of idolatry. I hope we'd actually finish them today. And I thought it was actually pretty good timing with this whole December season that we, we focus on these laws. I thought it was very relevant, very appropriate. Um, so we'll see if we can get through everything that I want to cover today. We'll see if yes, yes, if no, there's always next week. I hope everyone's Hanukkah was good. People did something special for Hanukkah. Danielle, I know you had a party last week. Anyone else did something? Yeah. Yeah, Danielle, how'd your party go? Yeah, we had um, a few different, well, several different parties with oh. different people. Oh, my light's off. All right. <laughs> um, you know, to be, instead of having a big get together, right? Right. Everything's COVID, different. COVID, COVID appropriate. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, we had several get togethers over the, the eight nights. It was really nice. We had a really, really nice time. It was beautiful. Thank you for asking. Yeah, yes. No. And you went to Springfield, Springfield, right? For the end. I also beautiful. had a nice Hanukkah. At one point I was I was thinking of having my Monday night class over. And then I was like, ah, none of them were willing to come. And I just got COVID nervous. I said, forget it. I didn't want anyone to come and God yeah. anyone get sick. And then, you know, mm -hmm. goes back to the party. I just, yeah. I just said, forget yep. it. I'll pass this year, yep. unfortunately. So I didn't have any parties. Um, and we didn't go out like we normally do every night. So it was a little unusual. But it still felt Hanukkah. Hanukkah feels special. It's a special time. There's a special energy. And every day I was looking for the the miracles of Hanukkah and every day I found something that I could say, okay, that was a Hanukkah energy special event. That was a Hanukkah miracle. I appreciated that. Uh, and then yeah, Thursday we went down to Springfield. That was the last night of Hanukkah it was Thursday night. Mendy, my son had his big, uh, instead of his, hi Dixie, instead of his normal um, Hanukkah gathering in the mall, he was lighting the menorah in the mall. He didn't have a gathering in the mall, but he did a beautiful menorah parade which is amazing for Springfield, Illinois. There were like- I saw that online. It was, it was really successful. It was beautiful. Yeah. I, I felt such joy being there and such pride for him. And it was yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. That's beautiful. It that is beautiful. beautiful. It was beautiful. They had a, they had a drive-in menorah oh, lighting here, yeah. which I thought was really creative. Um, so everybody like drove to a parking lot and we all parked in the parking lot. And then the uh, rabbi was- you know, lit the menorah and took the time to, you know, say some blessings and do some, some teaching for about an hour or so. And it was kid friendly and we had a, we had a really good time. Yeah. It was really you fun. In the car? It was really creative. Everybody, yeah. was, in the car. Everybody was in their cars. Yeah. Very cute. Okay. That sounds very safe. Yeah. Very safe. Very good. What about you, Larissa or Sally or Dixie? And if you did anything special for Hanukkah? We didn't do Nothing big. We didn't do anything special, small, just with the family in the house. Um, what was big, though, we were able to uh, more acceptance from family. So yeah. my husband's family, they're Catholic, my mom's family. The other Baptist, so there was more acknowledgement and acceptance of us not doing that. I mean, Christmas is still there. But it's, it's getting smaller. It's It's more acceptance with family. So that was a big thing. And they came over and acknowledged that with us and with the kids do they live near you yeah they live in the same town <laughs> the so, same little town it's the same little town uh -huh. so little steps but they're big ones for the kids to get to see that and so are you the only non-catholic people in this whole town no in the whole town no oh no. my mom was well christian all but different flavor christian with my my mom and then my husband's family's all catholic so that's huge little that's, that's, yeah. that's huge that's huge that they're, that, that they're not upset with you it's huge that yeah. they're acknowledging it. that's huge I, I take that as a big thing not a little thing at all that's, that's and, it. And gifts is, Hanukkah miracle yeah gifts they wanted to give were more we're trying to say involved there so we're trying to do that and then not on the Christmas day so we're trying to get them and they were more accepting of that. So we've got our steps going, which was nice. That's huge. That's yeah. not small. That's that's big and it's very painful, you know. So it's a very healing thing when you feel there's more acceptance. Yeah. It's very painful when there's not. Anyone else have anything about Hanukkah they'd like to share? 
Yes, we had a wonderful, wonderful time. We went on a Hanukkah parade. We put oh. the Hanukkahs on the top of our cars and went with the synagogue here, the Kabad. And we did a parade around town in Colorado Springs and out through um, the north end. I think it was about 30 miles we went. Wow. It was great. It was fun. And then we had, they had a dinner afterwards. And um, yeah, we had a great Hanukkah. That's awesome. How many cars were in that parade? 13. Wow. Yeah. Was he was my, my son more. in Springfield, where he had built 15 menorahs put on top of cars. This was his first year doing a, a menorah parade, but it was beautiful. And he had more cars even. He could have built more. And then my uh -huh. son, one of my sons is in a school in Little Rock, Arkansas, where there's like a teensy tiny Jewish, you know, religious Jewish population for sure. And he and another boy in the school, they built 70 car menorahs. Oh my I'm gosh. Like, 70? You're telling me there's 70 Jewish families in Arkansas and Little Rock? He said, no, like half of them will be on the cars of non-Jews. I thought that was so beautiful. So like 35 Jewish cars and 35 non-Jewish cars, and they all made this beautiful 70 car wow. Hanukkah parade. Unbelievable. Well, the cool thing about ours is they had a police escort and we got to go through all the stoplights. Mm -hmm. And it, too. it was so cool. Yeah. My husband yeah. says the first time he has a, a cop following him because we were the last car. So the cop was right behind us <laughs> and he went through every red light. It felt so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> it was very interesting. It was actually a little Hanukkah miracle because my son had reached out to the police and they out said to the police and they said they they could not do it for him. And then they showed up. So I was like, okay, great. So that was really nice. We were very uh it, it added to the parade. It definitely added to the parade. It was definitely very, very nice. So I told my son, every every down has an up. There's no such thing as down. There's no such thing as going down. Everything is going up. So I said, this year you had this unbelievable thing for Springfield, Illinois. I mean, there's nothing in Springfield, Illinois. This, this Hanukkah parade. And next year, you'll do both. You'll have your lighting Ooh. in the fall that you do every year. And you'll have a Hanukkah parade because you already have all the menorahs built. And he said, yeah. Yeah, so, that's wonderful. That's, that's wonderful. Only, only up. Good. So I'm glad people saw the lights of Hanukkah one way or another. Because they definitely were there shining for us to see. And I definitely experienced myself, as I'm saying, though I wasn't able to have parties and I wasn't able to go door to door like we normally do. But I still did feel the energy of Hanukkah. And it was a very beautiful, beautiful, beautiful energy. So we're discussing here practices that are forbidden as customs of idol worshipers. So we're going to go through that. And then we'll see if we have time to also discuss what words we're not supposed to say. So... Um, this we did. This is what we were up to. So something that is permitted to do in mid discussing, these are all like sort of trying to find the future type thing that even though they might seem as not really connected to idolatrous customs, but they really are in their roots are. And therefore, in general, they're forbidden. Something that's permitted to do actually, to 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 sort of get what is what message can God give you is to go to a small child who's learning the scriptures. And ask him, a small Jewish child, ask him to recite any verse he learned today in school. And whatever verse he tells you, we can view that as a mild form of prophecy. It's interesting, but in the time of the story of Purim, I'm sure you all know the story on some level, when Mordecai was trying to figure out what was going to be, he met three small children. And he asked each one, tell me a verse you learned today in school. And each one said a different verse. And based on the verses, he knew that Haman would have the downfall and God would be saving the Jewish people. So how was he allowed to do this? It's, it's something that is permissible. It's like sort of creating a venue, creating a, a medium for God to give you a message. It's not something you do every day, like go to your kid when he comes home from school and say, what did you learn today? <laughs> But in times of need, it is permissible, a permissible thing as versus all the other things we're talking about here, which are forbidden. Um, anything that we call divination, which means performing certain acts to clear your mind and concentrate sort of transcendentally until you can predict the future. 
So anything like that is forbidden. It's forbidden to do it, and it's forbidden to ask someone who does it. Um, a deceitful illusionist is someone who deceives others. I mean, obviously, that would be maybe like the idea of a, what we would call a magician today. Now, you could argue and say that a magician's no issue because everyone knows there's no magic and everyone knows it's a sleight of hand. But technically, the person should really have some type of statement that obviously this is, we're going to call, we're going to have fun and call it magic, but obviously there's no such thing as magic. And obviously, if you, if this goes on to YouTube and gets slowed down, you'll see what's going on. But we could all enjoy it. But someone who, you know, obviously in previous times was convincing people there's magic and he knows he's not a magician. He knows it's sleight of hand, but he's pretending to have all these magical powers is, is, is absolutely forbidden. Because again, it creates in people's minds this idolatrous beliefs that there are other forces out there because there's forces called magic. Person is saying God's giving him the ability to do this. This is magic. This is some supernatural force. So that's where it becomes idolatrous. Now there's there's also what you might call real magic, as we would call it nowadays, I think they call black magic, which in English you'd probably call such a person a sorcerer. Right? So what's a sorcerer as versus a deceitful illusionist? So a deceitful illusionist is someone that pretends he has powers, but he doesn't. It's just sleight of hand. And there's many people that do that today. A sorcerer is someone who actually is pulling on forces of evil to do things that are not humanly possible. And there is such an ability. That is absolutely forbidden. You might call it a witch if it's a woman and a sorcerer if it's a man. In previous times, there were, again, I don't know nowadays, so I can't vouch that there are such people out there. But in, pre, in the times of the Talmud, it discusses it. In the times of the prophets, it discusses it. People that did have the ability through pulling on forces of evil to do things that a human can't do. In, in fantasy books, it makes it very cool and positive. But in the eyes of Judaism, it's only coming from evil and it's very, very, very negative. Someone who actually would do something like that, someone who would be, as we call it, a witch, a sorcerer, or whatever, any of those terms, um, is punishable by death. If there was to be anybody who would do anything along those lines, they could access such powers and they're viewed as very, very, very evil. But again, most people today, they're making a magic show. I don't think anyone making a magic show is doing anything like that. But I'm not saying it's forbidden to attend a magic show because you're not being fooled by the illusions. You don't think there's a power to them. But in the ideal world, the magician would probably make some statement like, this is obviously not real magic, but you know, like, like enjoy the show, something along those lines. Um, true astrology is not forbidden. Now that again, astrology doesn't mean the, the horoscopes you read in the newspaper, because that's obviously just, you know, nothing. But there is the concept of real astrology, of really being able to understand what the stars are saying and to understand the, the, the energy, your energy as is being expressed in the stars. There is such a power and it is not viewed as coming from the same source as like a witch or a sorcerer. A witch or a sorcerer, the only way that could be real is through pulling on evil. Astrology is not pulling on evil. Astrology is a awareness of what the stars are saying. And there is such a concept and it does exist. Again, I don't know how many people practicing in, in, in fairs or something like that have the ability. But if someone truly does have this knowledge and have this ability, it is not considered forbidden. Um, incantations are forbidden. Um, there was this concept that people, if they got, got bitten by a snake or scorpion, to to whisper over it to give people like not incantations but to just to say things that would give the person who was injured like a peace of mind and assurance so it's interesting the law here because it says it doesn't help in the slightest but if the person is deriving a psychological benefit from it you can do it i mean there's two different things here An incantation is like we're saying these words and we're pulling on forces that are going to heal you that's forbidden because it's pulling on idolatrous concepts. 
If someone's just whispering over it, saying soothing words, it's not going to heal the bite. But if it makes the person feel better, there's a value in that and you're allowed to do it. Um, consulting with the dead, which is something people did know how to do. Various ways, sleeping in a cemetery, going to a cemetery, doing different things is forbidden. Anything that would make the dead appear to you, there is a concept. Again, in our world, it sounds like whatever, but there were people in previous times that did know how to raise spirits from a cemetery. And it was all from evil and it's all absolutely forbidden. Um, tattooing, people would in previous times mark their bodies with tattoos as a sign of idol worship. Any tattoo that has to do with idol worship is forbidden. If it's a tattoo, we're talking for, for non-Jews. If it's a tattoo, tattoo that has nothing to do with idol worship, it's permissible. But if it has anything to do with idol worship, it's forbidden. Um, anything basically that you're doing to, as an expression of clothing of idol worship, if you wear the clothing of people wear that belong to a certain cult, if you cut your hair in a certain way or grow your hair in a certain way or shave your hair in a certain way, anything that's associated with any of these idol worshiping or cults or anything like that would all be forbidden. Um, that was one topic. Now we're going to talk about swearing or vowing in the name of an idol. But before we move on, anyone have any questions on anything I said thus far? Okay. Now. It's forbidden, obviously, the same way we don't believe in idolatry, we can't do something that would honor someone else's belief in idolatry. So if we, obviously, we can't swear in the name of an idol, but we also can't allow someone else to swear in the name of an idol, which sometimes get a little sticky because sometimes you want someone to make an oath, but what are they gonna make the oath on? So what exactly are the laws? Um, now for you, not only are you not allowed to swear in the name of an idol, you can say, well, this is a false vow. <laughs> so maybe then I can swear in the name of an idol. No, you still can't. Because taking the name of an idol is giving honor and giving praise to the idols. You know, in your head, you're thinking, well, I want to make a false vow. So I'm going to swear in the name of something meaningless like this idol. It doesn't work. Because to the other person, you're giving honor to the idol. Um, of course, it's also forbidden to swear falsely. That's a separate issue. And it actually says that if you swear falsely, it's as if you're serving idols. So we're never allowed to swear falsely. We're never allowed to take back your word, except in certain situations that's considered justifiable need. What are situations, when, and this is, not, this is not anything to do with idolatry, but since we're talking about you can't take the name of an idol in, a, in an oath, even if it's a false oath, and by the way, you're not allowed to make a false oath, we're going to tell you the five situations when you're allowed to swear falsely, which is permissible to swear falsely, to deviate from the complete truth. But you still can't make an oath, meaning you can never make an oath and it be a false oath. But also in general, you can never lie. But there are five situations where you're allowed to deviate from the truth, but not make an oath about it because you're never allowed to make a false oath. The one is the most common one is to preserve peace between individuals to avoid someone's feelings, to give comfort to a distressed person. Like, let's say someone was ill and you know that their child passed away, but they nobody told them their child passed away because they didn't want to hurt them because they're anyway very ill. And if they're saying, oh, uh, is so-and-so coming to visit me? You could say, yeah, 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 yeah. I spoke to them and they're going to come. They're going to visit you. They're coming tomorrow. They're coming next week. They're coming as soon as they can. Now, that's a lie. You know they passed away. But you know the person's very distressed, very ill, and you don't want them to find out that this child passed away because it would give them tremendous pain. They're in a very tenuous situation. Um, if it's between couples, let's say um, you know a woman was out doing something her husband wouldn't want, and she lied and she said, oh, uh, I was you know, by your house. You're a good friend of hers. So I would just spend the afternoon by Larissa's house. You know, we were just hanging out, having coffee together. And her husband asked you, was, was, was Mary by your house yesterday? No, she wasn't. But if you feel, if I say the truth, it's going to cause a great argument. There's not going to be any benefit in him knowing. You'd say, yeah, 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 sure. We had coffee together. That's a lie. It's a lie that you're saying to try to create more peace between the couple. 
again, in that situation, maybe it's appropriate him to find out. I'm just making up something in my head. But I'm trying to show you an example where now, again, if he would say he wants you to swear to it, you're not allowed to swear. You're not allowed to take an oath. That's false. But you could change the truth in that type of situation. Peace between a couple. Someone's in pain. You don't want to hurt someone's feelings. Um, if you went out with a few friends shopping and another friend says, oh, you know, I, I heard you out with a few people. How come you didn't invite me? You're like, oh, it was no big deal. It was just sort of very spontaneous, which really wasn't happening at all. But you don't want to hurt her feelings and say, yeah, it was all planned and we didn't invite you. So in such a situation, you are allowed to change the truth to avoid hurting someone's feeling. Um, if you're in a situation where you're scared of physical harm, and the only way to avoid that physical harm is to deviate from the truth, you're allowed to. Again, you're not allowed to swear something that's false, but if you're not swearing and just saying your words, so normally you have to be very honest. If it's protect you from physical harm, you're allowed to change the truth. Um, sometimes you might feel uncomfortable, like caught in a too righteous act and that you don't want people to know about. So you could change the truth to to hide your good act you know if you if you spend the day helping someone and then you you someone says what were you doing all day yesterday I couldn't and you, you don't want them to know that you were you know out doing all this to help another person you don't want to say that because you don't want them to know what you were doing you want it to be private so you can say oh you know my phone was out of service I was I was I was in the mall I couldn't pick up a call it was too noisy you're not saying the truth, but you're allowed to because you have a very specific intention that you don't want to in any way appear like you're boasting over, over what you did. Um, sometimes for the sake of modesty, if that's needed, you could change the truth. If you're in a situation where there's a thief around and um, the only way you're gonna save your property or your money is by, is by changing the truth, you're allowed to do that to protect yourself from the thief. So those are the five situations where you're allowed to change the truth for those five reasons, but in none of them are you allowed to swear falsely. So if a, an oath was involved, you would not be allowed to do it even in those five situations. But if it's not an oath, in those situations, you're allowed to change the truth, but in every, oh, sorry for the phone ringing. My cell I closed, but that's a house phone. Um, but in any other situation, if it's not part of these five, then you have to be absolutely honest. Even if there's no oath involved, you're not allowed to lie. But in these situations, there's a permission given, even though, again, we try to avoid it, but sometimes you are in those positions and you're, we're being told you're allowed to. There's a sanction here, but not with an oath. Um, now, obviously, you're never allowed to mention an idol in a way of praise. Um, you're never allowed to mention an idol at all because that would be the very fact that you're mentioning it will be giving it praise. Um, uh, you will not be able to say, meet me on you know, the December 25th, giving the name of that holiday because that will be giving praise to it. Um, please stand and wait for me by that church would not be allowed because you're mentioning it, you're already giving honor to it. Anytime you're, you know, you're thinking, I'm not praising. I'm just using it as a marker, a marker of a location, a marker of a date. But you're not allowed to do that. I'm saying this is very relevant, of course, in the, what going, you know, this past week in America, because it's it's forbidden. Because the very fact that you're mentioning it already means you're giving it credence. It exists. It exists so much that you mention it. So that already is considered praise. That's already something you're not allowed to do. Um, now. It's not forbidden to mention the name of an idol casually, but it's inappropriate. Because it's like, it's like you're giving it honor, even though you really mean absolutely no honor. But because you're mentioning it, you have to be very, 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 very careful. That's why, and again, this is something maybe hard for people here because it's just how you grew up, but among Jews, we would never, ever, ever say the idol worshiped in the Christian religion. 
we would we would say a, a Jewish name, which is a reference, and in the Hebrew based on the Talmud, it's we say Yashka or some say Yeshu. Maybe we'd say initial. I mean, we wouldn't really, but you know, one could say initials like JC or something like that, but we wouldn't get any closer than that to it. Because it would be considered that the very mention, even you, you don't mean anything respectful. You don't mean in any way to give honor. You're not saying it as a means of belief at all. But just mentioning it already is like giving it more credence than you should, even though you don't mean it in any way to give honor to it. Now, if you were mentioning it in order to like explain, well, this is how these Christians do this, and that's something different I'm not going to do, so you're, you're doing it to learn what to not do, then it'll be acceptable. But that's like basically the only situation. Um, now, obviously, any idol written in the Torah, you're allowed to say, Pa'or, Baal, Navo, God, um, because you're only saying it in a fashion as the Torah is saying it, to nullify it, to denigrate it. But obviously, you're not swearing in the name of it. You're not mentioning it for any, obviously, anything that has any respect. Um, Now, let's say you have someone's name that's the same as the name of an idol. Happens. Um, are you allowed to say their name? So you are, obviously, because in your head, it's only for this person's name. It is in no way a reference to the idol as well. By the same token, you have to be very careful, especially like this time of year. You have to be very careful when you talk to idol worshipers. And sometimes it gets a little like sticky, like, you know, like I was speaking to someone and I was, I was thinking, should I, you know, normally say have a nice weekend. And I was like, should I say it? Should I not say it? And I was like, well, I think I could say have a nice weekend because I'm not saying, you know, whatever. I'm just, you know, I would always tell them have a nice weekend. So, you know, I wasn't sure. And I thought, okay, I could say it. Maybe I couldn't have said it. I don't know. I did think before, was I allowed to say it or not? Um... But you definitely can't say when I worship or may your God be with you. May your God give you success. Do this for me in the name of your God. Obviously, anything like that is giving a credence. Is giving, you know, I don't believe in it. I'm just trying to motivate them. But I'm trying to make them feel good. But you can't say things that are forbidden to make them feel good. So you can't say any of those things. I have a question about that, Cyril. <clears throat> so what if you are talking with someone that is Christian or Catholic and you ask them or you reference them praying with you or for you or about someone and you know that they are praying in JC's name. So that's a very good question. So the question would be, that's something we're just about to touch on in terms of prayer, but it's really the same question. Does this person believing when they're praying are they praying to JC or are they praying to God? That's really the question. That's really hard to answer because a lot of people will say at the end of their prayers in JC's name, mm -hmm. but some people refer to that person as God, unfortunately. So sometimes you don't fully know. But so that's hard because there is a concept. Yeah that a non it's a differing opinion among the sages some of the sages say a non-jew is allowed to believe in what's called shutfus some of the sages say they're not shutfus means partnership and and the question really is like this is for sure with christians a question do they believe in god and they're viewing jc as like a support system you know, like, like some there in the Pantheon, but there's God. And then, you know, there's a partner called JC who's like some, I don't know, sort of in some fuzzy way connected. Or they're viewing JC as a God. So if they're viewing him as a God, it's, it's, it's idol worship. If they're viewing him as like sort of a, a, an accessory to God, then according to some of the sages, it's okay. According to some of the sages, it's not. For a Jew, it's totally forbidden, no question. For non-Jew, some sages say it's okay as long as it's like there's God and this is like a 
I can't think. What if they it. believe that he's the son of God? So what does that mean, the son of God? I don't know. Maybe someone else knows. I I really don't know. I don't. I, I don't. I really and, I, don't. I, and I bet you know, Larissa said before about different sects. I bet different Christian yeah. sects have different opinions on what the term "son of God" yeah. means. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I, I'm sure they do, and that would really yeah. be going. In other words, the essence question is: if this person is praying to God, this Christian is praying to God, and their vision of God is that God has a son, but they're praying to God, then it's fine. They're praying to God. Because there are some sages that say that's okay for a non-Jew. There are some that say it's forbidden, but you can rely on the sages that say it's okay. But if they're viewing JC as God, you know, there's God and then there's another God called JC and he's, they're both gods out there. Then you could not have them, you could not acknowledge their prayers because their prayers would be to an idol. Does anyone have more understanding than Danielle about like exactly what most Christians believe? Because I remember Danielle, we were discussing yeah. this because we used to think mm -hmm. that Catholics have a more idolatrous right. version and regular right. Christians don't. But then Danielle asked a, a friend of hers who's Christian, mm -hmm. but a very religious yeah. Christian, not Catholic. Yeah. And based on the, the message that the friend sent back, which I read, yeah. it sounded completely idolatrous. Yeah, I was surprised by that. I was actually. surprised also. Yeah. It was a regular Christian and sounded completely yep. adult. So I don't know. Yes. I, I would, I mean, anyone, obviously, I don't know as much as anybody here would have more understanding of what that term means. Mm -hmm. I might be able to help you a little. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah leave it to me. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that most Christians believe he is God that you have to go through him to get to the father, that basically he is an intermediary and yeah. you have to go through him. You cannot go directly to God himself. That is kind of the doctrine of Christianity. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's, a good way to, they, that's a good way to describe it. But wait, yeah. well, did that's you, why that doesn't they, mean he's a God if he's an intermediary to God. But he is, you can't get to God without him. In other words, he is a, he is the son of God and he is the God that will get you to the father. He is, um, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of complicated, but that's why they pray in his name and not God's name. Because yeah, there's no, is, oh, go ahead. Sorry. He is basically the, um, the um how do i want to say it he's the connection you cannot get to god he is their connection to god there's so no clear pray directly to god that's what you're saying you cannot pray directly to god if you're a christian you don't believe that you can correct. pray directly to god correct you cannot go to god the father you have to go through jesus and then catholicism expends that even more mary is above jesus and so basically, if you will, uh, watch a lot of the Catholicism, they pray to Mary. They have their beads and all that stuff. And that's because they go through the mother and the son to God the Father. It, it's very complicated, but from what I have been through in all my years, Jesus himself is an intermediator, which you can believe in an intermediary as long as you don't worship him as God. The problem is my friends seem to worship him as God. Right, that's exactly they the question. They teach it as a, oh, go what, ahead. What are you gonna say, Larissa? I was gonna say what she was saying is, is correct. They don't offer a very clear explanation of exactly how, it's just a you must believe these three things are god but are somehow also separate but you have to pray to this one jc to be heard by god even though they're all three supposed to be the same but separate they're talking about uh their spirit which does its own separate thing feelings and guiding and everything so the essence question if a christian is viewing him as an intermediary, but not viewing him as God, then it's okay. Correct. Right. But the they, problem is. But if they the view him as God, it's not. You're right. That's exactly it. 
And it, that's why we hope and pray that most of them use him as an intermediary. But there is an, a lot of them that use him as a Godhead. In other words, you've got your three in one. They're all part of the Godhead, which makes Jesus a God. Right. And Second then it's God, Correct. So 90% of the Christians are forbidden what they're doing. It's idol worship. And they don't see it that way. If they're just believing he's a prophet then it's and okay. an intermediary, it's fine. It's but fine. most of them, I, I, I honestly thank God my mother finally got it. <laughs> I Before that, she didn't get it. And I mean, she, she got to listening to us, listening to all the Jewish talks, the, the, the rabbis and everything. And she got her really thinking. And finally, before she died, about a year before she died, she said, I understand. He's a prophet. He's just, he's just a prophet. He's not God. Thank God. Wow. I said, I'm so thankful. Wow. But my family, wow. my family are still hung up that my sister, my brother's not. But he, she's still hung up that he's the God. He's a God. Part of the Godhead is the whole thing. It's how they view him in the Godhead. Right. So that's a good question. So going back to what Danielle asked, if you're dealing with a Christian who you suspect views him as a God, then you cannot acknowledge the prayers, cannot want, cannot have them make a vow, cannot do anything because they're because it would be giving honor to idolatry. But if, as Dixie is saying, as Larissa is saying, this is a person who believes him as some type of spiritual spirit intermediary, like like I'm not I'm not saying this is a term they would use, but like akin to an angel, right? So you could view it. You could be. Now, are you supposed to use the angel as an intermediary to God? No, of course not. You're supposed to talk to God directly. But if you view the angel as an intermediary, and you're praying to the angel to convey your prayers to God, that would be permissible for a non-Jew. Because there are some sages that say it's permissible and therefore you can rely on them, that it will be permissible. So that's what Dixie's saying when her mom said, oh, he's a prophet, great. Yeah. Obviously he wasn't a prophet, but that's okay. <laughs> Meaning that the fact that her mom yeah. took away divinity from him and instead is viewing him as an intermediary to God, she now is in the realm of Coaster, because a non-Jew yeah. can, view, can view again. That's what we mean by the term in Hebrew shutvus. Can view another force as an intermediary to God, and that's okay, but not as a god. So, if you're not sure and you want to err on the side of caution, yeah. then you would not acknowledge the prayer. You wouldn't reference the prayers. You would. You just would like somehow change the subject or figure out something to say that would avoid is- that. It's just such a hard topic for, I mean, specifically me, I assume others can relate when you have so many people in your life that are, I mean, like James's family, they are Catholic, they are devout Catholic. Um, and we, you know, still try to have some sort of connection with them. Um, you know, we're very close with them, of course, but, you know, just like I was on the phone with her before this call, James's mom, and, you know, she mentioned my sister, she's very sick, and she mentioned, you know, I will pray for her as soon as we get off this call, she's on my prayer list, and it had me thinking when you were mentioning that, like, oh, wow, you know, and I, you know, and then I have people who I don't fully understand if they, what their thoughts are or their feelings are about JC and who exactly they're praying to, but they're friends of mine. And the fact that they're talking with me about God is a huge breakthrough for them. Right. And so how do you address those kind of conversations with either people that you're really close to or people that maybe you're not very close to, but you're thankful that they're opening up and speaking about God with you. And so you don't want to turn them off. You know, Okay, I'd like to answer that because uh, I've gone through this for quite a few years. Um, and you're going to find, my, my, I thought that if I would ask them when they prayed with me, I said, please just do not pray in Jesus' name. I said, please, just pray, pray, and pray to God, and, but please do not use the name of Jesus. Well, they were open and they were even 
interested in some of the rabbi's teachings until I said that. And the minute I said that, they have become distant. They're still friends, but we do absolutely nothing with them anymore. But the minute you say, do not pray in Jesus' name, you're going to find out they are going to blow up. And it's sad, but that's all I'm, you know, I, it's best. Yeah, just to Dixie, leave them that's alone. what I'm worried about. Yeah. Just Absolutely. leave them alone. Let them do their thing and just don't, don't agree in prayer. That's all you, what I do when somebody wants to pray and they end in Jesus' name, I just say, I don't agree in prayer. And that's it. I don't agree with their prayer or whatever. Um, I don't know if that nullifies it or not, but maybe Trisel can tell me. Yeah. I'm saying it's very complicated because it really is yeah. like, like it's so individualized to what mm -hmm. degree. Like I understand what Danielle's saying. You, you'd rather them talk about God than not talk about God. So mm -hmm. talking about God is a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. um, that's for sure breakthrough is talking about God. And you don't want to shut them down and you don't want to shut down talk about God, but you can't, you can't acknowledge it if it's, um, would it, would it, could you say something along the lines of only use JC as an intermediary, but not as God, or is that like too sticky? Depends on the person. I would have to say it's a very ingrained, depending on which yeah. form of Christianity they're coming from. It's yeah. a very ingrained kind of teaching. Mm -hmm. So it's, it would be like you can't really ask them to separate because they can't separate. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly mm -hmm. right, Cyril. Yep, you said it perfectly. They would be so confused and not only hurt emotionally, but also just mentally confused. Like, how do I pray without that? That doesn't even Coming away sense. from it. It's yeah. a huge, yeah. uh, it's a huge thing. It's a yeah. very scary thing until you learn more and understand. It's a very, it's very ingrained. Sure, sure. Same thing, Larissa, on your journey, it was very scary, like breaking away from it, that. It's a huge, big no-no, like like yeah. Yeah. And it takes, it's something that, I don't know, they have to be ready for, they have to want to hear, they have to want to learn truth. Exactly. And yeah. even what then you there's that. If your mom was talking about praying for something, what would you do? Um, we haven't. <laughs> it's a slow conversation with my mom. Um, she's no longer going to church, not entirely because of everything I've said. I, I think maybe there's an influence there but there was a big rift in her church but then she left the side group she was going to and now it's turned into I just I, I read in my bible and I pray on my own and I don't need that I'm like right okay maybe we have an opening and and we're getting somewhere it's just going to take longer but I hear what she has to say I offer my ideas and things that I've learned and I offer those and I kind of just leave them and then i'll tell her how i think on certain things and then i kind of leave it at that for her to ponder I, I, I think that's very wise and we believe that words of truth that come from the heart penetrate and we always just go back to that if it's words of truth and it comes from the heart it'll penetrate and even though dixie felt that she turned off all her friends <laughs> <laughs> but knowing their words of truth knowing they came from dixie's heart we just say you know what truth hurts sometimes <laughs> penetrate doesn't mean it doesn't hurt you know sometimes it dixie's hurts Dixie's really good at talking like that though i'm the opposite i just want to be nice <laughs> and you know it's it's everybody has a different dixie's style. very nice but she's very to the it's, point and i love that about her situation just not when your mother-in-law says yeah. that that's a delicate relationship is your mother-in-law just to not comment. Don't say thank you and don't say anything. And that's it. She just don't comment. And if she wonders, well, why don't you say thank you? Maybe you'll look at her to think why you didn't say thank you. You know? <clears throat> not in situations with my mom, but with work. My boss, I, home health and hospice. And then we, we do 
some things like uh, there was a family who he was reaching the end of his life, but they also had their wedding anniversary. So we came together and helped them celebrate that. It was one of their wishes. But then my boss is the pastor's wife of one of the churches in town. So then they're part of that as well. So there was also that entire aspect in that, even though it was work. So there was no separation. So I, I don't know, my way to support that and give them what he wanted for his wishes reaching the end of his life, but then not participating in their Christian aspect was, I don't know, I tried to make it, I'm not going to bow or close my eyes, like bow my head and close my eyes when you're doing your praying. I'm just going to be here and not look like I'm participating. So there was that instead of like acknowledging, I don't know. That's been very difficult. Hoping it was. Because your boss was there. <laughs> That's, that's I don't know. Yeah, difficult hard. situations. Yeah, hard. work has a lot of challenges for sure. Especially this time of year. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I, I think what Larissa said, like just sort of putting out ideas is very good. I mean, that's what I do with people I know that are not religious. Just like you say things. If they're interested, we can continue the conversation. If they don't pick it up, I move on, but if it's a long-term relationship, I'll drop comments regularly, drop comments regularly. And I trust that, that, that they're penetrating, you know, when they're ready, if they're going to be in a state where they want to talk to me about it, they will. If they're going to mull over the ideas themselves, they will. But, you know, we have to just keep putting out seeds of truth and more seeds of truth and more seeds of truth and, and trust that, that um, the flower because they're true and they come from my heart. So I know they'll be accepted, you know? And sometimes it's hard to sort of weave it into the conversation so it sounds natural, but that's what I try to do. Just sort of, you know, weave it into the conversation. So I'm just sharing some idea or I'm, you know, saying something, you know, as versus just sort of saying, well, only use him. Just remember, he's not God. <laughs> you could be in a meeting, he's not God, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Might be too big a bombshell, but, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, so just came to mind. Um, you'd asked about my mom. She very consciously limits her use of JC's name around me. And she now just, she catches herself. Sometimes she doesn't, but it's a very obvious conscious effort to not say that now. Respectful. And then just That's great. God. So how many years has, has this been going on for? With her doing that? Uh, this year. <laughs> Just started this year. Wow. Yeah. After how many years of you, of her realizing that you have a different set of beliefs? About four. And then the last three and a half, two, really, okay, I've kind of let you guys know and worked you into it. Now we're going to be a lot more, this is what we're doing and what we're not doing. Wow, that's very impressive of your mom. Very that's very good. That's very good. I have people that I'm very close to that will be like, oh, JC, oh, I know you don't believe in him, but <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very close to you. So that's great. Literally, that's so that's good of that, your mom. That that's that, amazing. That's really special. She's for, aware. That's beautiful. For her to be so conscious for you. I mean, that's, I think that's huge. That really is. So you got to appreciate the, the miracles. You know, that's, that's an amazing shift and only four years. That's not a long time. You're saying such a deep ingrained belief of hers. And after four years, her understanding that in your presence, that's hurtful and not respectful and therefore not trying not to do it. That's amazing. And that gives hope for other people. So thank you for sharing that, Larissa, because that's really amazing. Yes. I think that's amazing. So again, it's sort of complicated because going back to this, the idea of like what we're talking about here is vows, but it's, it's of course, what Danielle said about prayers is the same idea. And um, if, 
If a person, let's go back to a vow. If a person is making the vow, again, it's so complicated though, because it really sort of depends on how they view him. Usually, even I guess, in a, really a vow would sort of be like a combined vow. So a combined vow really would be okay. Not great, but okay. So if a Christian is swearing in the name of God and you know that when they say the name of God, they mean God and they mean JC, it's still okay because they do mean God. And on some level, their vision of JC in some way is an intermediary to God. So since God is there in the vow, it's not, it's okay. If they would make a separate vow and they would make a vow to God and then a vow to JC, of course that's forbidden that vow to JC because then they are giving him a separate status or like Dixie said before, if they would vow in the name of, of Mary or vow in the name of JC, either of those vows would be forbidden because they're viewing them separately. If they're making like a combined vow where they mean God and they also mean these other intermediary forces, it would be okay because they do mean, they do mean um, God. But again, it, as we're saying, it gets very, very, very sticky in terms of, you know, uh, to what degree are they viewing him not as an intermediary, but as, 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 as a, a god. Um, now, obviously, in general, like let's go back to this Christian situation, you in general wouldn't want the Christian to swear because you know he's including JC in the vow. There's only a situation where you absolutely need him to swear that it would be okay because there is a reference to God and because it's needed. But if he just would swear in JC's name, it would be forbidden or anything else. Um, and that, of course, is, is a very big belief of Mashiach, that we know that when Mashiach comes, the entire world will recognize God. It's very interesting because, like, you know, the most central prayer of Judaism is the Shema prayer. You say, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. No, there are many, many, many levels of meaning of that prayer. But on the most simple level, as Rashi, who's the commentator of the basic meaning of the words of the text, of the words of the scriptures, he says that what that prayer means is now God is our God. But in the times of the Messiah, in times of the Mashiach, God will be everyone's God, that there'll be one God that the entire world will accept. And there are many, many, many verses, of course, of the prophets that state that, that the time of the Mashiach means a time when the entire world will serve God. It's very interesting that in the prayer, that's included in every one of the prayers we say, we end all of our praying with Aleinu, we accept upon ourselves God. That's one paragraph. And the second paragraph says, and therefore we hope to the times of the Mashiach, Messiah, the Mashiach. And what are we describing there? It's a whole long paragraph, you know, there's lots to talk about in the times of the Messiah, you know, the resurrection of the dead, the ingathering of the Jews, the service in the temple. We don't say any of that. But that entire paragraph is devoted to is saying that the entire world will worship God. So it is that fundamentally part of Mashiach, of Messiah, that the entire world worships God. So we have to hold on tight because we know Mashiach is coming very, very, very soon. And we live in a crazy world between Corona scares and vaccine scares and, and, and election craziness and all the other Black Lives Matter riots. I mean, everything we've gone through this year, I mean, it's definitely the world just just, just definitely coming to Mashiach because it's, it's so much going on in this world. Definitely, it's a sign that wake up and turn to God and know you're vulnerable and know you need God and know only God is the answer. And hopefully all over the world, people are. That was very nice. I had one so, over Corona. I had something, I don't know, I think my daughter's ticket got canceled. I had to call on a reimbursement. It was the middle of the night. For me, it's most easy to call in the middle of the night because I'm up and you don't have to wait online so long. And I can make the call then. And I know it's not somebody in America I'm going to get. 
at that point. It's usually probably like some in the Philippines or India. So I called and I could see by the accent, I'm, where are you from? The Philippines. Okay, great. So we had a very nice conversation. And I was saying, you know, now with Corona, you feel so vulnerable turning to God. She's like, oh yeah. Yeah, she said, I didn't used to do this, but now every day I first pray to God and then whatever, I start my day. Now, based on what Dixie or Benaniel was saying, I don't know what she meant when she said God. I just took it as God because we only use the word God in the conversation. So I hope she meant God. Um, but it was very reassuring that, yeah, that's, that's what's supposed to happen. The world is supposed to, as, as, as everything, as you know, nothing, you, can, you can't rely on anything else in the world anymore. And there's nothing there that's, that's giving us support besides knowing there's a God and he's forcing Mashiach. He's bringing Mashiach. He's bringing us to a point when we, when the whole world is going to acknowledge him and only him. And that will happen. So the fact that Dixie's mom came to this point a year before she passed away is an amazing merit for her. An amazing Dixie that you were able to keep your mom in your house so she absorbed the atmosphere and the truth. That's unbelievable. I think it's amazing of Larissa's mom that she's being so respectful and realizing on some level that this is wrong. It's not acceptable on some level. Just each time she holds herself back, it's reaffirming something years off. So that's amazing. And not going to church anymore is amazing. And you know, all of you should be so blessed that the people that you're close to and you love, you're able to bring them closer and closer and closer to God. And just by your personal example, by being honest, by being real, by saying words that are true, words that come from your heart, drop another drop, another drop, another drop. You know, I, I know we've mentioned this before, to me it's a very strong vision, is um, one of the great sages, his name was Rabbi Akiva. And for the first 40 years of his life, he was completely ignorant. And when he was 40, he married a very special woman that said she would marry him if he would go study. So he agreed. And he was, he was 40 years old. It was really hard to learn the ABC, so to speak, at age 40. And he felt so discouraged. He said, forget it. I'll just, I guess she'll divorce me. What can I do? I, I meant it sincerely, but I just can't learn. And when he was going back home to tell his wife, Rachel, that, you know, deal's over, his brain's like a rock. He passed and he saw a rock that had a pole perfectly bored into it. He was like, wow, how did, how did such a smooth hole in this rock? And he realized it was a drip of water. And that drip, 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 drip of water over who knows how many years, hundreds of years perhaps, had bored a hole in the rock. And he said, wow, if water is so soft and a rock is so hard and water can penetrate a rock, surely Tyra that's so powerful can penetrate my human mind and heart. And he went back and he studied more and he eventually became the greatest sage that Israel had. A very, very special person with a very special life. So that's how we view many things in life. It's another drop, another drop, another drop. And we keep giving drops of truth. So even if Larissa's mom is going to use the rift in her church as the reason underneath it, it could be all those drops and drops and drops that she's absorbed that sort of made her feel it's a good excuse to stay away. So we should all merit to see that with the people we're close to, that the drops are penetrating and flowering and bearing fruit. And we should merit to have the time soon when we have a complete revelation of Mashiach, and then the entire world truly will be serving God. All the entire world will want is to get closer and closer to God. And that will be true for every single human. And you will be the teachers because you'll know so much more than anybody around you. Everybody will turn to you. First, I'll be turning to you with a complaint. Oh, and they'll man. say, what happened? Why didn't you tell me? you will be like, I tried. They'll be like, no, nah, you didn't really try hard enough. You had tried harder. I would have listened. Obviously, you didn't try. And they'll also be turning to you for knowledge because you'll have so much to teach everyone around you. It should happen very soon. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. And Sally, so glad you joined us for this first time. Hopefully you'll be able to come on again. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well.
I have to say Shabbat Tov. I didn't hear what she ended with, but that's okay. <laughs>